So starting today, we're completely pivoting to a new topic. It's like we have two courses in one. And just so you know why, when we reformed the CS curriculum a few years ago, we realized that we needed to have both databases and scripting languages in our program, that you needed to have been exposed to both. But we needed or felt we needed to keep the core curriculum to roughly 10 or so courses. And that meant that we didn't have room for one full course on scripting languages and one full course on databases. And as a result, what we did was we basically said, OK, we're putting the two topics in the same course. Half the course will be databases, and half the course will be scripting languages. There is some linkages between the two, because many of the scripting languages that we're going to be talking about in this course, PHP and JavaScript, they are used for creating websites. And the back end, PHP, which is typically used for server side programming, typically needs to access a database in order to interact with a client. And we will actually see how that gets done in PHP in one of our lectures. So there is some linkage between databases and scripting languages, but I admit it's, it's a fairly tenuous link. I'm just explaining why the two topics kind of seem so juxtaposed in this class that and it can be kind of jarring right now to go from talking about relational databases to something much more programming oriented, which is what the rest of this course is going to be. The, um, the next seven weeks, you're basically going to be introduced very quickly to three scripting languages, to Perl, to PHP, and to JavaScript. We have roughly seven weeks. Each of them gets roughly two weeks. So what we're doing is hitting the highlights of each language. And you're going to get a taste of programming in each of those languages. When you come out of here, you'll have basic knowledge about them. You won't be an expert in any of them. But at least you can say that you have seen them when you're in a job interview. So today, going to start by giving you a high-level introduction to scripting languages. And then we're going to start in the Perl itself. And I described on the first day of classes why these three scripting languages, to kind of summarize that discussion, we're going, going over Perl because it is perhaps the most widely used scripting language. It's hard to know whether it or Python is. Perl is very useful for extracting data from files and producing reports. It also is widely used by systems administrators or IT staff for handling various IT tasks. So we start with Perl. It's also kind of the first widely used scripting language. Some might say Tickle was. Others might say Perl. I'm going with Perl. Then the last, second two that we cover, PHP and JavaScript, are widely used for developing web applications. We first cover PHP, which is used to do what is called server-side scripting. So it's the scripting language typically used on servers to handle interaction with a client. And then JavaScript is the scripting language typically used for what is called client-side scripting. It's used for creating, um, not creating the web pages, but basically taking input that the client provides, packaging up stuff and sending it back to the server, and then taking whatever the server sends back and updating the web page. So JavaScript typically is running on your computer, your laptop, your iPhone, whatever mobile device you have, whereas PHP is running on the back-end servers. And web development is 
one of the most common things that you will have to do in any job that you have, so we feel it's important that you be introduced to the two languages most widely used for doing web development. There's plenty of other server-side languages. P Perl is sometimes used. Python is used. Java may be used. Ruby may be used. There's a plethora of other languages. Those are probably the four most common. On the uh, client side, Visual Basic um, is often used for Microsoft Windows. Um, but it is not portable to other platforms, particularly Macs and Linux. So JavaScript is the more widely used language. So we had to choose several. Those are the ones we chose, and that's the reason why. Python just didn't have enough time to go over it. And for those of you taking 365, I probably will cover Python in 365 next semester. OK, so why were scripting languages first developed? What was the niche that they were expected to fulfill? And the answer is that they are designed to accomplish specific tasks quickly without concern for machine efficiency. The emphasis is on programmer efficiency, being able to quickly write a program. And it may be that this program, say, takes an hour to execute, whereas if you wrote it in a compiled language like C++, maybe it would take a minute to execute. So it's going to run 60 times slower, maybe, on whatever scripting language you've written it. But it might have taken you five hours to write that C program, and it might have taken you 10 minutes to write the scripting program. So if you add up the time that you took, which was 10 minutes, plus the hour the computer took, that's an hour 10 minutes. If you add up the time that it took you to write the C program, five hours, and the time it took the C program to execute one minute, that's five hours, one minute. So in total, you got your result much more quickly by writing the scripting program. One of the key things about scripting programs is that they're often one-off things, where you just need to write something quickly, and you don't need to use it again. So compiled languages like C, you would typically use them when either the total time, programmer plus computer time, would be less than for writing a scripting language and its computer time, or because that C program is going to be repeatedly used in the future. Like if I'm writing some kind of simulation program, I probably plan to execute that simulation program many, many times. In that case, the five hours I spend writing the simulation program is nothing compared to the fact that the simulation program may be run hundreds of times. Now it was really worth it to put five hours in to get a really efficient program. But if I only plan to use this program once or twice or three times, I'm much better off writing the script, which takes me 10 minutes, and then suffering the fact that it takes longer for the computer to compute the results. So the scripting languages were meant to allow you to write a program very quickly, and oftentimes you won't use it again. Now, the first question that may come to your mind is then, these things are used for server-side scripting and client-side scripting. They're used over and over and over again. What's with that? In those cases, what's often happening is that they either are doing very short operations, like in the JavaScript with a form, it may simply be type checking the information you provided in a form, like was that telephone number in the right format, was the um, email address in the right format. And as soon as it knows it's in the right format, it just pushes it to the server. Well, 
it really doesn't matter if that takes one millisecond or 10 microseconds. Who cares? It's such a short task, we don't care about machine efficiency. In the case of the PHP scripts, they typically are just putting together a web page, which is pretty quick. And then they're dealing with back-end software like database software that has been written to execute efficiently. So PHP doesn't implement its own database. It interacts with a database package, which people have spent countless hours optimizing. So whenever a script needs to do a computationally intensive task, Typically, you actually have the script call a compiled program rather than having the script do it itself. So the PHP programs that are running on servers typically aren't doing anything that's computationally intensive. Anytime they have to do something computationally intensive, they delegate that task to a compiled piece of software. So that's why you can actually have a script that seems to get repeatedly used, yet is, quote, not efficient. In fact, it is efficient because it's delegating most of its computationally intensive tasks to a compiled piece of software. So emphasis is on programmer efficiency. What does that mean? What do scripting language developers design, or what features do they put into their languages that are programmer friendly, but perhaps computationally inefficient. The first thing they go for is economy of expression, meaning that you can express things very succinctly. Just like on your, when you text someone, you often use abbreviations for things, like LOL for laughing out loud, or you might say um, see you rather than saying see you. Okay, so that's economy of expression. You do it all the time. And many scripting languages have that kind of economy of expression. Perl is notorious for having very concise syntax. What that also means is that often the syntax is not particularly readable. We'll see that when we get to Perl. Perl, in fact, has often been called a write once Whoops. Write once, read never language, because the syntax is so concise that when someone looks at it, or if you look at it in six months, it looks like Egyptian hieroglyphics. It really can be that dense. Okay, so it really is meant as a throwaway program. Now they also will do things like make it easier to create lists and or use hash tables. The syntax is much simpler, and we'll see that when we get to it. The second thing they do is they don't force you to declare your variables before you use them, which takes up a fair amount of time in programs to actually have to declare a variable before you use it. Okay. The lack of declaring variables means that the scripting language does not know when it starts executing what the type of the variable is. So if I just say um, A plus B, and I don't tell you what their types are, then I can't compile that expression. Okay, In C, this plus could mean a whole variety of things, right? Because the plus operator can be overloaded. It could mean integer arithmetic. It could be floating point arithmetic. It could be string concatenation. If you've overridden the plus operator from some class, it could mean something else. The bottom line is if you don't know the types of A and B at compile time, you can't generate a machine instruction that will efficiently execute that operation. A compiler, by contrast, if it knows that A and B are ints, can generate a machine language integer add. Or if it knows it's a floating point, 
operation, it can generate a machine language floating point ad. So the scripting languages don't know this information. Therefore, they, in effect, have to run in what's called interpretive mode, where they don't know until runtime what the types are for A and B. And therefore, at runtime, they have to say, if A and B are integers, then do integer arithmetic. Else, if they are floating point numbers, then do floating point arithmetic. Else, if they're strings, do string concatenation. That slows the execution down considerably. So that's the trade-off, is the lack of variable declarations shortens your program. That's economy of expression. But it means that you can't optimize the program and generate machine language. You have to interpret it. So it runs more slowly. Because you don't declare variables, the scripting languages support flexible dynamic typing, which means the way they determine the type of a variable at runtime is by examining its value. And at different points in the program, different data types could be assigned to a variable. So early on, you might say A equals 10, B equals 20, and echo A plus B, and the result will be 30. And then you might say A equals Brad, and B equals uh, space Vander, echo A plus B, and now the result will be Brad Bander. If you tried to do this in a compiled language, you'd get an error message saying one of those assignments is illegal. But in a scripting language, it is fine with that. The first time through, right here, A and B are considered integers. And the second, when you get down to there in the code, now A and B are considered strings. So that's the meaning of flexible dynamic typing. You can actually assign different types of values to the same variable, and hence their type dynamically changes. Okay. Fourth difference is that they provide easy access to system facilities. And you might say, wait a minute, so does C and C++. They also provide easy access to system facilities. But think about it for a moment. Is that really true? If I write a C program and on Linux, do you think that's, and it accesses the system facilities, do you think that same C program is going to win run on Windows? Almost certainly not, because Windows has a different set of system commands than Linux. So compiled languages tend to be operating system dependent. If you access the system facilities of a particular operating system, you have to access what are called the native, you have to use the native commands if you're in a compiled language. So for example, if you want to list the contents of a directory using C, if you're running on Linux, you would say ls to get the contents of a directory. But if you're running on Windows, you would say dir. Scripting languages typically build in their own set of system commands. For example, in Perl, the command for listing a directory contents is dir. But that command works on the Mac, on Linux, and on Windows. And the reason is that dir is a built-in Perl command. And depending on which operating system the Perl interpreter is running, it will convert that dir command to the appropriate native command. So if it's running on Linux or the Mac, it will convert the dir command to ls. So it is easy access to system facilities. What it means is that it is operating 
OS independent. And you can be sure that it will operate properly on any operating system without your having to change the name of the system commands. Okay, the fifth thing, and this is what really made Perl popular, is sophisticated string handling. If you've used C or C++, I'm sure you know that its string um, handling capabilities are, shall we say, challenged. Okay, it's not easy to manipulate string text in C or C++. But in reality, a lot of what we do is manipulation of text, especially these days. Okay, that's what data mining is all about. You know, Facebook and all these social media posts are all about text. So scripting languages, starting with Perl, introduced the sophisticated pattern matching um, techniques that allow you to specify the form of the data that you're searching for. So for example, I might want to find all dates. And I could specify that dates maybe have the form dd for digit, say dash dd slash ddd, that that's the form of a digit. And now tell the Perl interpreter to find all strings in a text file that match this particular pattern, and it would return all the dates. That's a very powerful technique. That's why Perl is used for doing data extraction. You can very quickly with these patterns extract the kind of information you're looking for. And in addition to the pattern matching, it then has ways of rearranging that information. So maybe you want to change it. Remember, this is not the way you could store it in an SQL database. In an SQL database, it has to be stored as DDD, and then this is the month, so month, and then year. So this goes here, this goes here, this goes there. So they also provide ways to rearrange string text very efficiently. The next feature that they have is built-in high-level data types. Okay, by the way, all of these are also getting back to economy of expression. Okay, these patterns allow us to extract data from a file much more efficiently than it can, or not much more efficiently in comp computer cycles, but much more efficiently in lines of text written than if you were doing it with a C++ program. And then the big win in terms of economy of expression is that almost all scripting languages have built-in um, lists and built-in hash tables. They don't have that odious STL, which every time I use, I cringe at its cumbersome syntax. Even Java's syntax is a bit cumbersome compared to what you get with scripting languages. So, Lists and hash tables are built in. We'll see with Perl how that operates and with each of the, also with PHP and JavaScript. But that means that the syntax is built into the language for handling them rather than there being library calls. And you don't have these iterators to iterate over them. You have built in clean language constructs for iterating through these data structures. And finally, like I said, the scripting languages are interpreted. They have to be interpreted because there's no good way when you start running the program to know what types your variables have and therefore what machine instructions you'll need to execute them. But even on top of that, interpretation gives you some clear-cut advantages when you're creating programs. Specifically, it leads to rapid prototyping. So if you're running a program that's compiled and it crashes, and let's say it's a big system with millions of lines of code, you have to shut down the program, 
Maybe it's been running for hours. That's immaterial. You have to shut it down. You have to fix the bug. You have to recompile it. Then you have to relink the entire system, which could take minutes or longer. Then you have to run the program again and wait several hours before you find out whether you fixed the bug. Not very productive use of your time. With an interpreted program, you can actually go in and directly change a few lines of code, reload that one function without changing anything else, just change one function, and can pick up execution from the point where the error occurred. You can go and fix variables because you can dynamically assign values to variables. So you can fix the variables that were wrong and put the expected values into those variables. And you can pick up execution from that state. So basically, you can debug much more quickly with an interpreted language. If you're trying to do something with a customer, then you can quickly try out different things. So the other day, I was with uh, trying to get a good color. I was trying to come up with a good color for the boxes. Okay, Kyle's smiling because we went through this exercise in the TA meeting for CS102. But to show you interpret it, the way that I can change that color is pretty simple. Let me actually get onto the server first. Okay, so here it is. F0, just like I need to write this down because if I lose it, <laughs> I will not be a happy camper. F0, E6, 8C. This is hexadecimal for colors. Okay, so originally I had as a background color yellow. Okay. With an interpreted program, which is what this is, web pages are interpreted, voila, I can immediately change things without having to recompile my entire web application. This is just one page in my web application, so all I have to do is change it. We could try this. We could say, okay, what do you think of blue? Not so good. Okay, so we just we kind of um, went around a few times and finally forget what this color is. Khaki. Actually, this is khaki. But at any rate, this is what interpret it gets you: is I can quickly tweak a few things and then just reload one file, and I can change. Things change on a screen. This is also true of graphical user interfaces. So I can sit there and quickly try out different styles, different looks, different feels, whereas if it was compiled, I'd have to shut down my entire web application, change that one color, recompile the entire thing, bring it back up, and that might be several minutes while everyone's sitting there thinking, wow, or punching away on their iPhones, whatever, but it's not particularly productive. So that's what interpreted languages get you, is much more flexibility in your debugging, in your prototyping. It, it definitely um, reduces your development time considerably. Okay? A lot of people will even develop complex programs first in a scripting language and get it to run. And once they have it working, the algorithm right in a scripting language, then 
they will re-implement it in a language like C++. But at least now they did all their testing and debugging in the scripting language where it was fast. And now they'll put it into C++ and then they'll use bigger test cases that might take an hour or two. When they did it in the scripting language, they'd use small test cases to make sure it quickly um, terminate it. So questions about this. This is really the core of what makes scripting languages so much more attractive than compiled languages, why they have become so popular. Okay. Now the other thing to know about scripting languages is that they're frequently designed for a niche market. They're not typically meant to be a general purpose programming language. PHP was designed for server-side scripting, and specifically it was designed to make it easy to create HTML pages on the fly, dynamically. JavaScript was designed to be used in the browser, and it was purposely had certain critical features removed from it, like the ability to do file I.O. Okay? That's very much should be a comfort to you to know that JavaScript can't do file I.O. Why? Well, it can't go browsing through your files looking for your passwords. Okay? So you can be sure that when you download a page that contains JavaScript from an untrusted source, it's not going to go pawing through your files looking for all kinds of, you know, data that you think is private. Okay? Well, because of that, JavaScript is a pretty weak language. It can't do nearly as much if you can't write to files and read from files. But the, by giving up that ability, it makes it a secure, trusted language. So it's perfect for browser scripting. Perl was designed specifically for doing fast data extraction from files and then summarizing that data into reports. Later system administrators found it was, oh, good for doing IT tasks. And oftentimes it's then used like when, it when um, web applications first started, it was adapted for use with server-side scripting. But it was kind of like a square in a round peg. And people quickly developed languages like PHP that were directly meant to facilitate server-side scripting. And hence, um, you can write a much, you can more quickly write a PHP program to do server-side scripting than you can to write a Perl program. Okay, Python is kind of the exception. Python actually was kind of designed to be general purpose. It's very, it's like a high level C. You can do stuff very quickly in Python. So that's perhaps the one language that is designed to be more general purpose. But oftentimes scripting languages are designed for niche markets. They're not meant to be used for general purpose programming. But when you make them designed for niche markets, you can make them what are called domain specific. So you can build in information into them about the domain. PHP is very good at generating HTML pages because it knows a lot about them. It's got built-in knowledge about HTML pages, which means it's very efficient at producing them and at allowing you to create them. Okay, so when you can, Tickle was the kind of, many people consider it the first scripting language. It was good for graphical user interfaces. Well, it had a lot of built-in knowledge about doing graphical user interfaces. So it made it very easy to create graphical user interfaces. So that's the advantage you get with domain-specific languages. They can contain a lot of knowledge about what it is they're dealing with. And that means you don't have to write all that logic into your code. That logic is already available in the interpreter. Whereas if I write it in a general purpose language like C, 
I'm going to have to put in all that information into my code about how to handle HTML or obviously use a library. Okay, so questions about that. Fantastic. Okay, so, by the way, my Perl notes are organized so on the left-hand side, it's like a table of contents. You can click on the left-hand side and you'll immediately jump to that part of the page. Okay, so that's kind of nice for being able to get around in your Perl, in the Perl notes. I really should do that for all my notes, but I haven't had the time. And also, I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of these notes. I expect you to read them. I will put you to sleep if I give you a blow-by-blow -blow account. What I'm going to do is focus on what I think are the interesting things or the things that are different from compiled languages, and um, especially because it's for many, well, many of you have seen somewhat of scripting languages, but Still, it makes some of the, I'm going to go through and show you some of the points that were made on the slide, the different things like built-in data types, pattern matching. You'll see how Perl handles that. Also, just give you a quick bit of history. So, Perl's history it was designed in the mid-'80s by Larry Wall. Like I said, he was wanting to extract information from files, create reports, and he was doing it using a combination of Unix scripting tools, such as Gref and Awk, and C. And he found it very tiresome having to go back and forth. So he thought it'd be great if he could integrate the two things into a common language. That's where he came out with Perl. And you can see Perl stands for Practical Extraction and Report Language. Hence what it was meant to be used for. The reason that system administrators got to liking it is the fact that it includes shell commands and things like sed and grep that are very useful for finding your way around file systems, which is what IT staff have to do a lot. Okay. The other thing is that Perl is eventually going to undergo a major transformation. It still the most widely used version is Perl 5. That's what we'll be using in this course. But Perl version 6 at some point is supposed to become the dominant version of Perl. When that happens is anyone's guess since Perl 6 was first introduced in 2000. Okay, so hasn't yet broken in. That's partly because there's a lot of legacy code in Perl 5 and partly because I think the syntax for Perl 6 is quite honestly more cumbersome. They kind of made it more like a uh, compiled language and I think Perl 6, because I've seen some of it, is just not as easily usable. For example, they introduced iterators. Well, that's great if you're doing heavy-duty programming. Iterators are really handy if you're doing heavy-duty programming and are like dealing with a lot of threaded stuff. But if you're writing a quick one-off program, iterators stink. Okay, they're cumbersome. They clutter up your code. They slow you down. I hate the STL's iterators. Every time I have to use one, I curse them, literally, at how odious it is um, to use them with their syntax. So the fact that Perl decided they needed iterators just goes counter to the whole idea of ease of expression. So I think that's what's in part hurting the introduction or the um, acceptance of Perl 6. But at any rate, it turns out that before Perl 6, there wasn't even an official standard for Perl. You basically had a bunch of programs, a test suite, and if your interpreter that you wrote passed the test suite, it was considered a legitimate interpreter. Starting with version 6, you have your interpreter must conform to an official document. So that's supposed to be an advantage to Perl 6. Okay. So 
Perl's advantages, I've already told you, very succinct. And there are often half a dozen way, different ways to accomplish the same task. So you often can find, it's just like if you are a carpenter and you have six different tools for doing something, you're really skilled with it, you can really just select the right tool and be very quick and get the perfect job. Okay? The flip side of that, of course, is that most of us weren't that expert. We look at those six tools and we think, wow, which of these should we use? The claw hammer or the ballpoint hammer? Maybe we should use the sledgehammer? Wonder which would be best. And you sit there and 20 minutes later, you're still trying to figure out which is best. And if you'd just chosen one, you would have been done 15 minutes ago. Okay, so one problem with having a lot of choices is people actually can't make up their minds. The other problem is that someone else looking at your code may have no idea what that feature is. They may not have learned how to do it that way. Now they have to go scurrying to the documentation to figure out what this esoteric tool is that you just used. Okay, and it is the sad case that a lot of Perl code has to be maintained. Okay? As I said earlier, it is so succinct that it looks like hieroglyphics after a couple weeks have elapsed. Okay? So it's very hard to read. Okay? But it was not designed to be you. It was designed to write one-off scripts, stuff that would never be used again. But then it got to be so useful that... Um, People start creating legacy code. So there's um, information in the notes about where you can find Perl help. I'll let you read that yourself. Perl has what's called a command line interpreter. So you invoke a Perl script by actually on a command line typing the word Perl and then a name of a file that contains script commands. And by convention, the file ends with the .pl suffix. You can also make it executable so that you could just say foo.pl if your first line in your file has this pound sign bang character and then the address of the Perl interpreter. Okay? This makes your code totally non-portable. Right? First of all, this is assuming what kind of system, what kind of system does this assume we're running on? Unix-based. Okay, so we've already limited ourselves to Unix-based systems. And if I give this uh, program to say Kyle. There's no guarantee that he put or that his system has Perl in that directory. If it's in some other directory, it's just going to say Perl interpreter not found, and Kyle will gnash his teeth and say, well, on to someone else's code. Okay. So it tends not to be a good idea to put this into your file unless you're an IT person and you're dealing with a specific system and you really don't care about making it portable. Okay, and we'll get to this along the way, but there's ways at getting to the command line arguments through variables and ways at getting at environment and variables, but um, the at sign indicates an array, the percent sign indicates a hash table. We'll get to those, but those are two built-in variables. One points to the argument command line arguments, the other points to the environment variables. Okay. If you're developing Perl, Perl is very forgiving. Okay? Perl will bend over backwards to try to help you. So if you have this statement here, a equals five times this character string, there is a good chance that your result will be 60. Anyone tell me why? Five times 12, because the first part of that string is a number. So it will basically say, can I convert the string to a number? Ooh, string starts with a number. Why, yes, I can. 
It doesn't even have to completely consist of a number. Okay? So it will bend over backwards to let you do stuff like this, but it may not be what you intended. This actually may be an error. So when you're doing your development, it's often a good idea to run Perl with the dash W flag, which will give you verbose warnings about stuff. And once you submit it, or like when you submit it to the TAs, when you submit your homework assignments, I don't want dash W in there. If you um, run this on a server, you definitely don't want dash W. So it's only a development option, but it will tell you stuff like perhaps 12 at Fred 34 isn't what you want it. Okay? Or you might um, notice that dollar sign A was only used once in the program, which isn't what you think. You might think, well, it's warning me that I never did anything with it, but no, actually what Perl thinks is, since you only used it once, maybe it's a typo. Maybe you misspelled the variable, because it can't imagine that you would do some computation and then not use it, right? Okay, so encourage you to use the dash W option when you're developing your scripts. And when I say developing your scripts, what I mean is developing a program that uses Perl commands. Okay, comments begin with pound sign, and they're either at the beginning of the line or they can be at the end of the line. Essentially, as soon as you put a pound sign in your program, the rest of the line is a comment, no matter where you put the pound sign. Then we come to the types of variables or the types of types that you have in Perl. And there's essentially four basic data types. You have scalars, which you're all familiar with, integers, doubles, characters, strings. These are the basic ones. Then you have arrays, you have hashes, and something called references, which are essentially pointers. Okay, so those are the four basic types. Perl does not have a Boolean type. Essentially, we'll get to that, how it handles Boolean conditions. If you want the equivalent of an undefined value, you use undef, which is a constant. It is not null. Okay? C has, or C++ and C have null, and it means a... Um, in basically a um, null pointer. That's not the meaning of undef. It literally means a variable is undefined, has no value associated with it. So I could say um, dollar sign x equals dollar sign a times 10. And if I've never assigned a value to dollar sign a, then dollar sign a is undefined. This will actually, in this case, undef used in multiplication will be coerced to a zero. And the result will be zero. But that's what I mean by undefined. It is OK to use undefined variables. OK. Um, you've already seen that Perl will try to use dynamic casting. So if I say three times eight in double quotes, it will dynamically cast the eight to an integer. And you don't have to do the casting. Okay. And you can see here, scalars always, scalar variables start with a dollar sign. That's how Perl knows that a variable contains a scalar value. Prefix it with a dollar sign. The syntax for arithmetic expressions looks essential and assignment looks just like C and C. So we're not even going to bother going into it. This is the one thing that may look unusual. The backslashes. On your keyboard, 
it is probably up in the upper left-hand corner. You'll see a backwards single quote. And that executes a command, and the result of the command is assigned to the variable. The result comes back as a string. In this case, it's the list of files in the current directory. It comes back and is stored. And I know I said dir is the directory command in Perl, but in this case, this is causing a direct call out to the native uh, system uh, call, which is ls on a Unix machine. Okay? Because Perl was designed for doing data extraction and working with text, it has a very rich string type. Strings are a built-in data type, unlike in C or C++, or even in Java. Okay? Even in Java, strings are not a built-in data type, right? Anyone know why even in Java, strings aren't a built-in data type? They're a class, right? They're not a um, scalar, they're a class. Okay? By definition, scalars are built-in data types. They're not classes. Okay? In Perl, a string is a built-in data type. Okay? And you have the usual quotes, but it quickly gets a lot more interesting. The first thing you can do is you can interpolate variables into your strings. So I said dollar sign dog equal collie, then I say dollar sign comment equals I love my dollar sign dog, and the result is I love my collie. Because it takes the value of dollar sign dog and replaces, well it replaces dollar sign dog with the value of that variable. That's called interpolation. Variable interpolation is what that's called. Okay, and you'll see you can do the same thing with arrays and values and hash tables. And then sometimes you're not sure it could be ambiguous where the variable name ends, so you're allowed to put the variable name in braces so that Perl absolutely knows where the variable name ends. So that's double quotes. You're also allowed to have strings that have single quotes. Okay? Couldn't do that in C. In C, that would be a char. And it could only be a single character. But in Perl, it can be arbitrarily. It's an arbitrary length string. Anyone know what the difference is between single quotes and double quotes in Perl? Right, so single quotes, no variable interpolation. It will not try to interpolate. And it also will not try to interpret control characters. So no variable interpolation and no interpretation of control characters. Okay. What that means by interpretation of control characters if I say I love backslash n my dog, or let's say, we'll just say dog right now. It's no, this would be printed as I love my dog because it would interpret the new line character. If you put that same string in single quotes, it will print out as I love and whatever the however it decides to print a new line character, it will show up as I love my dog all on the same line because it won't interpret the control character. So single quotes means don't interpret anything. Okay? It also means that backslash is useless. If you want to say, um, I love my collies um, I don't know. C 
certainly not going to be breath. Oh, let's see. I love my collies. What? Fur? We'll do something nice. Fur. That doesn't work because the string will get terminated right there. You could say, well, I'll just put a backslash in front of it. But remember what I just said about no interpretation of control characters. So that backslash is not interpretive. It will still terminate right there. Now it will just be, I love my colleagues backslash. So if you want to use anything, if you want to use single quotes, you have to actually put them in double quotes. And then the third type of string is the one that has back quotes. Okay, and the back quotes contains a command, and when you curl will execute that command, and whatever the return value in will be stuffed into a string and returned to you. So three types of strings, single quotes, double quotes, back quotes. Each of them does something different. Okay. And as befits a language, it has a ton of string manipulation functions, which I will allow you to peruse on your own. Just suffice it to say that there are tons of things you can do with strings that don't even involve regular expressions. All kinds of options for substrings, all kinds of ways to find substrings and strings to find indices. I'll let you read all about it. It's pretty simple. Okay. Next thing I want to emphasize, Booleans and undef. There are no Booleans in Perl. So undef is often one way to use a Boolean value. When it's used in an expression, it means false. Okay. In fact, it's very flexible. Undef, when used in arithmetic, is zero. When used in a string expression, is the empty string. And when used in a Boolean expression, is false. Remember dynamic casting? Very happy, Perl's very happy to cast undef to whatever value um, is required. So Perl is a little more, has a few more values for false than C. So zero is still false. Undef is false. Anything that casts to a string containing a single zero is false. Okay, but that's particular. So this string is false. But this string is not false because the second string contains two double zeros. And that is not comparable to a string that contains a single zero. Try it. If you try to ask, is a string that has a single zero equal to a string that has two zeros, the answer will be no. But the string consisting of zero is false, and the empty string is false. Okay, that's a string that is either empty pair of single quotes or an empty pair of double quotes. Everything else is true. So that's how Booleans work in Perl. So if you have an expression that says if something, if that expression evaluates to any of these four things, it's false. If it evaluates to anything other than one of those four items or values, it's true. Okay. And importantly, because I get this question every single semester, so please see that little thing there. You can always ask whether a variable is defined using the define function. Okay, so it returns one if it's got a value associated with it, and it returns undef otherwise. Okay, I'm going to skip standard I.O. for a moment. 
move on to arrays. Arrays start with an at sign. So if you see an at sign in front of a Perl variable, it means it's an array. An array is essentially a list. And Perl has very simple syntax for specifying a list. It is a comma-separated list of values inside parentheses. That's a Perl list. You can assign a list to an array. The array would have four elements. Arrays start at index location 0, just as in C. You can see here that if you want to access an individual array element, now it's a scalar, so you put a dollar sign in front of it. So you say dollar sign, the name of the array, and then the element you want to access. Unlike C++, you can also easily get to the end of an array. So if you use a negative subscript, then you are moving from the end of the array. So minus 1 gives me the last element of an array. Minus 2 gives me the second to last element. So it's a very handy way of going from the back of an array. Okay, I just want to point out in a lot of code you will see this QW right here. QW, and it just says that I don't want to have to quote everything. So you could say at dogs equals QW um, border collie uh, black lab. And it would notice I didn't have to use quotes around each of those. The first entry would be border collie. The second entry would be the string black lab. So QW just says that I'm creating a list of quoted words. And the commas indicate the separation between the strings. OK, very concise. But again, if you haven't seen QW, you'll be looking at it and thinking, what the heck is going on and off you go to the internet and you waste time. I know it happened to me the first time I saw QW. It was definitely what goes on here. Okay, and you can even do this. You can take the result of a command and it will basically use white space as the delimiter, and it will assign each white space delimited value to one entry in the array. Another cool feature is the ability to unpack arrays. So you can actually take an array and assign values. So in this case, the first three values of the nums array is assigned to A, B, and C. And there's other things you can do as well that'll let you look at. But this is really cool. The reason it's really cool is that you can now return multiple values from functions. Okay, You couldn't do that in a traditional language. And even in Perl, you're not allowed to return more than one value, but you are allowed to return an array, or a list, actually. And then when you return a list, you can easily unpack that list into a bunch of variables. So if I wanted to write a function called minmax, okay, I could pass it some arguments, and then I could assign the results to dollar sign $min and dollar sign $max. Okay, that's really cool. So the ability to unpack an array essentially gives you the ability to return multiple values from a function in a very clean, elegant way. The other uses that you see in the notes are less often used, but I wanted to highlight that one. Okay, if you want to find the length 
of an array, you prefix it with the keyword scalar, and that will give you the length of an array. Okay, and then there is a whole bunch of commands for manipulating arrays. Remember, arrays are essentially lists. So the commands are actually list commands, like pop, push, shift, unshift. Uh, at any rate, again, you can figure this out easily enough by looking at the notes. I'm not going to go through it. Okay, then we come to hashes, which are also called associative arrays. And they start with, or hashes start with a percent sign. And if you want to access an element, then you use curly braces. And again, you're now treating it as a scalar, so you will prefix the name of the hash table now with a dollar sign when you're accessing a value. And the key is whatever you choose, so that's the key. The reason it's called an associative array is just key value pairs. So it looks a lot like an array, except instead of using integer indices, it uses arbitrary indices. Usually strings, but they could be objects, they could be integers, most often they're strings. There's multiple ways to assign the simplest but kind of not particularly easy to read way is as a list. It's got to be, so each, they pair off. So here we have the key is black, the value is Labrador, key is red, value is setter, key is white, value is poodle. So basically all odd words are keys and all even words are values. To make it a little more obvious what's going on, you can use the equal greater than sign, no space. And that makes it clear that black is associated with Labrador, red is associated with setter. Anyone else notice anything else that's different from the highlighted thing versus the first one? I'm not using quotes for the keys. Okay, so, and when you actually access something, you also don't have to use quotes for the keys. Okay, perfectly fine to use quotes, but they don't make you do so. Again, economy of expression. Anything to save a couple keystrokes. And then you can interpolate, you can't interpolate an entire hash table into a string, but you can interpolate one of the values into a string like that. Okay, and again, you get a lot of handy functions for dealing with hash tables. It's pretty obvious, so I'll let you read about it. Last thing I'm going to talk about today is getting how you get I.O. And we'll, this is just simple I.O. from the user. So if you want to print something, print or printf works. Print takes a comma-separated list of expressions, puts a space between them, and prints them out. Okay, so here I have print, the answer is, then dollar sign x, then backslash, that doesn't seem right. I thought it actually put, just a second, let me try it. So this is where you can just try stuff quickly. So you can go to the command line interpreter, DE stands for debugging, E for expression, so I'm just giving an initial expression, so let's print. Brad Vander Zanden does not put a space between it. Okay. Hmm. Well, I said it did. 
so this statement is wrong. I will get it fixed. Does not concatenate them together into a single string with intervening spaces. In fact, you have to put the intervening space in there. Okay, you also have to put the new line character in there if you want to get a new line. And then there's printf, which works just like the C plus, um, the C version of printf, just like it. Okay, so that's for printing. You can read a line. So Perl doesn't read single values. It reads entire lines. Okay, there's a good reason for that. It is text-oriented. Perl was meant to deal with files. Files, ASCII files consist of lines. So Perl and most scripting languages are line-oriented. Okay, that's something you have to get used to because C and C++ and Java are all stream-oriented. They take one token at a time. Almost all scripting languages are line-oriented. You get an entire line, and then you have to chop it up into fields. Perl does not have a way to read a single token. Okay, so if you want a line from standard in, you use less than and greater than, and in capital letters, standard in, and that will suck an entire line. You're also, if you don't have command line arguments, you can omit the standard in. And then you do, this is called the diamond operator. But if you have command line arguments, this won't work. It will then treat each of the command line arguments as a file, and it will read, this diamond operator will read the line from one of the files. Basically, it'll take all of, it'll treat each command line argument as the name of a file. It will try to read all the lines from the first file, then concatenate to it all the lines from the second file, and then all the lines from the third file, and then it will return the first available line. So it doesn't work if you have command line arguments. In that case, you have to write it this way. Okay, you get the whole thing back, including the new line character, which is annoying. So it has the chomp operator, which has it's a side effect function. It actually eliminates the new line character at the end of the line. And you'll frequently see this idiom, chomp dollar sign line equals diamond operator. So it reads the line into dollar sign line and then chomps the new line character off of it. And finally, it returns undef when you reach the end of the file. So this is a very simple way to read all the lines of a file and print it. So this is cat. Okay. In fact, you wouldn't even have to say chomp. You could have just said while dollar sign line equals the diamond operator, print dollar sign line. But I just wanted to show you that if you chomp off the new line, then you can cr still print out a new line by including it in the double quotes. Okay? So we will get to references on Tuesday, and we will also start getting into regular expressions on Tuesday. Okay, um, I know that it looks like there's homework starting today. It really doesn't start until next Tuesday. So don't worry, you're still dealing with 